All right, so uh, kids, if you want to go to kids' ministry, we've got, what, K through or pre through five, something. And then youth, uh, you guys are also dismissed today. Pastor Chris is going to share a special message with the youth. Anybody that wants to get out, get out now. This is your chance. But adults, if you're dropping your kids off, come back in. So we, uh, if you're just joining us today uh, here at Calvary Chapel, we uh, study book by book kind of through the Bible. Right now we're in the book of Revelation, looking chapter by chapter, kind of verse by verse uh, at that. We're sort of at the front end of the study. We're still uh, looking at these uh, letters to the churches. This morning we'll be in Revelation chapter 3, looking at verses 7 through 13 is the goal uh, if you're joining us at home, we're super glad to have you. Uh, I'm excited about this text and what the Lord uh, has for us this morning. Um, as Susie mentioned, on that first Sunday in May, we're planning to do something sort of agape-oriented. Probably won't be a big sit-down feast in the back, but we may have some kind of walk-away food, some snacks that we'll do out in the front. So uh, if you're able, plan that day maybe to have lunch here and uh, we can all stand around and fellowship and shout at each other from six feet away and, and do those things that we're supposed to do. So let's pray and just ask that the Lord would really bless his word uh, this morning. So Father, we thank you again for the privilege of being here, Lord, this opportunity uh, to worship you, Lord, and to be ministered to by you. And we pray, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, that you would do just that, Lord, that the teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here today, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. Father, um, share your heart with us this morning, we pray, Lord, and we know you want to do it, and so we ask you to do it, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, this morning, we're going to continue on. Uh, to our next church, which I think in many ways is our best church. And it's the best church in the sense that it's our best example of a church that really blesses the heart of Jesus. And there are, there are so many lessons from this church. Like I said before, we want to jump right into it because I think what we're going to see is that this letter, maybe even more so than any of the other six, um, this letter is so packed with encouragement, and it is packed with promises, and it really provides us with a very clear picture, not just of a church corporately, but of a believer individually, right? What are the marks of a believer that really blesses the heart of Jesus? And just very quickly, we did a, a more thorough review kind of as we jumped back in last week. But just real quickly, we first uh, saw the church at Ephesus. Remember, that was the loveless church. We went on to Smyrna. That was the persecuted church. Pergamos was the compromising church. Thyatira, of course, the corrupted church. Church. Last week, we looked at Sardis, which was the dead church. And now kind of continuing, moving around in our arc of the seven churches. This morning, we're going to look at lessons from Philadelphia. Right? Jesus addresses the church there at Philadelphia, very often referred to as the faithful church. And as we jump in here with verse 7 of chapter 3, we're going to see that Jesus begins just as he has with his words to all of the other churches. He starts with a reminder, he introduces himself with a reminder about himself, something specific, something strategic that would have really encouraged that specific body of believers in their situation or their circumstance. So look what he says in verse 7. He says, To the angel, or the pastor, the messenger, of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things says he who is holy, and who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Now, the ancient city of Philadelphia was about 28 miles southeast of where we just were in Sardis, and it was a relatively small city. It was actually the youngest of the cities, but it was a very prosperous city. It was located right in the midst of an agricultural area, a very fertile valley which produced grapes and therefore housed vineyards, and it was right along that main highway 
that led from Europe out to the east. And so in very many respects, Philadelphia was kind of the gateway, if you will, from one continent to the other. It was a, a beautiful city. It was known for its beautiful buildings. It was often referred to as a little Athens. And of course, also, it was a city which was deeply steeped in pagan idolatry. Amongst all of these beautiful buildings, you could find all of these different temples to all of these different gods that were available kind of from that ancient Greek and Roman menu of different false gods. The city of Philadelphia, as we said, was pretty young. It was just founded in about 189 BC by a man named Eumenes II. And when he died, he was succeeded by his younger brother, Attalus II, and what Attalus II did is he named all these buildings after his older, older brother. He minted coins with his brother's image. He was constantly talking about his brother. And so consequently, the people of the town began to call him Attalus Philadelphus. Because Philadelphus is the Greek word for love of a brother or brotherly love. And so in time, the name of the city simply became the city of brotherly love or Philadelphia. And of course, right off the bat, I think that just the name speaks to us because there is a love that the Bible talks about specifically called a phileo kind of a love or a, a Philadelphia love. And we all talk a lot, we're very familiar with that agape love that God supplies. It's that unconditional love that God gives us by his Holy Spirit. It is what is the fruit of the Spirit. But the Bible also says we're not only to love each other as Christians with this same kind of agape love, but that we're to phileo love one another as well. We're to love one another with this brotherly affection simply because we are all part of the same family. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it doesn't mean that there's not some good old-fashioned kind of sibling squabbling that goes on. Maybe even once in a while there's a little rock'em sock'em robots, right, that goes on within the body of Christ and the family of Christ. But we're called to look beyond all of that stuff and realize how it is that we are all connected in such a close and an intimate way. And maybe sometimes you've heard, maybe people even teach, that according to the scriptures, that we have to love other Christians, but we don't have to like them, right? And boy, isn't that convenient sometimes, right? And yet I think we understand what they're trying to say, and yet, if it's to the neglect of this phileo love, right, this this affection that we're to have for one another, that, that understanding that we are all going through the same things as Christians as we live in this world. And so if it's to the neglect of that, then it's to misunderstand the way that we're really called to love one another. The New Testament is filled with verses that talk about the need for brotherly love. Here's just one. When Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 12, he said, let love be without hypocrisy, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. And then six other times in the New Testament, we're called specifically to this same kind of brotherly love. And what I think we'll see as we study this church in this city is that they really lived up to the name of their city, right? This church was characterized by a warm sense of affection, not only for one another, but also for those we're going to see around them. We're going to see that they are one of only two churches in all of these seven letters to the churches that Jesus makes no accusation about, right? He has no criticism whatsoever at all about this church. And as a result of that, rightly so, everybody throughout the history of the church wants to be a member of this church that we're going to look at this morning, right? Again, at Calvary Chapel, we don't have church membership, right? What we all want to be a member of is the church of 
Philadelphia. And so in Jesus' words, we're going to see the marks of the members that are part of this church, starting in verse 8 with his approval of them. He says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Now, what a wonderful resume for a church. It's short, but it is sweet, right? In the midst of this first century pagan environment and culture, with all of the immorality and all of the wickedness that was a part of every city of all Greek culture at that time, the believers here in the church of Philadelphia, they stood steadfastly against that flow. Jesus says that they've kept his word. They held fast to the teachings of the scriptures, right? They haven't denied his name, right? They held fast to the deity of Jesus Christ, that in his name alone was the power of our salvation. It's as Peter said in Acts chapter 4, that there is no other name among heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, it wasn't popular then in such a pluralistic society with, you know, a different God that you could find to worship literally on every corner. And it's not very popular now to claim that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven based on what the Bible teaches. And yet it's the truth. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. And the church at Philadelphia, this was a group of people who was faithful to that word, faithful to that name and everything it meant, and that they continued to teach that in this environment, whatever the pressure, whatever the persecution we're going to see that they were facing to do that. And yet, they did it because they recognized their high calling. They realized, as it says here, that Jesus had set before them an open door. Now, in the New Testament, an open door represents an open opportunity to take the gospel into the world. Right? That great commission that the Lord has given to each one of us to reach out even beyond our own church and reach into that surrounding world with the gospel. Of course, the very final words of Jesus recorded before his ascension into heaven, in Matthew 28, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." So it's his commission, right? It's our calling to take that gospel to everyone else in the world so that they would have the chance to let the gospel change their lives in the very same way that we've had that gospel change our lives. And notice, Jesus begins that whole great commission with one word, doesn't he? What is it? It's go. Because an open door is pretty much useless if no one will walk through it, right? If no one will go. But this is a church, right, that didn't just know the Great Commission or could preach about the Great Commission. They were a church who knew what the commission was and then they obeyed that commission, right? They went through that open door. Now, here's something that's pretty fascinating about the city of Philadelphia itself is that it was actually established with the deliberate intention that it would be a missionary city for Greek culture and for the Greek language pushing it out into the surrounding areas. All of those surrounding areas which the Greeks considered to be barbarian. Remember, in the Greek culture, they considered any group of people, no matter how advanced or how educated, how ancient they may have been, but anyone who didn't speak the Greek language, anyone who wasn't steeped in the Greek culture, 
they were just bar bars, right? Everything they said sounded like bar, 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 bar. So they were barbarians. And they needed to be evangelized. And so here at what was, if you look on the map, it's kind of the eastern edge of Western civilization. This city was purposely placed there. It was modeled after the very best that Greek culture and Greek architecture had to offer. And it was supposed to be an outpost for the export of all things that were Greek. And of course, everyone living here in Philadelphia, they knew that that was their purpose. And the church that was there in Philadelphia, of course, they would have been looking at things with this as their context. And so in that light, what Jesus is saying in essence, think about it, that if the world had gone to such great lengths with such great intention and such great motivation to advance something which was so much less great, right? As great as you may think that Greek culture was, but if the world would do this, if the world did do this for the sake of advancing something so temporal, then we should be willing to do the same and so much more so to take the gospel and for the advancement of the gospel and the eternal salvation of men and women. And the church in Philadelphia understood that. They lived with an eternal perspective, right? And others, a very outward focus. They had a, a worldwide vision, unlike the church of Laodicea, which we're going to see next week, was so completely self-consumed. You know, all around our world, it, it, as well as in our neighborhoods and in our schools, if that, our job sites, there are doors for ministry that are always opening, sometimes are closing. So it's important that we be alert and ready to take advantage of those opportunities when God gives them to us. And yet I think if you're anything like me, so often, God sets an open door of evangelistic opportunity right in front of us, and we just plain don't see it. There's a, actually a great story about a man who'd been touched by Jesus, and he came to Charles Spurgeon, right, the prince of preachers, came to Charles Spurgeon, and he asked how he could win others to Jesus. And Spurgeon asked him, well, what are you? What do you do? And the man said, well, I'm an engine driver on a train. And Spurgeon said, okay, well, is the man who shovels the coal on your train, is he a Christian? And this other man said, well, I don't know. And Spurgeon said, well, go back, find out, and start on him. And I, I think, you know, so often there, there are these open doors. It might just be an open door to encourage a brother or sister that's faltering or to share the love of Christ with someone who's suffering or hurting. All of these things are the fruit of a faithful church and they're evidences that the Lord is working through us and that he's a partner with us in this mission, this great co-mission that we're on with him. It's not at all, I think, by coincidence here that this church, which was so focused of all the different churches, this church was so focused on the gospel and on evangelism and on this open door that Jesus says he had provided for them. It's no coincidence that it's one of only two churches, like we said, that Jesus makes no accusation against. Right? He has nothing bad to say about these people. Now, historically, this church, many believe, represents that faithful church kind of of the last days, what many might also refer to as the missions age of church history. Beginning in about the 1800s, there started to be this kind of a stirring within the dead denominationalism that had strayed from that simplicity of the gospel, right? As the church of Sardis gives way here to the church um, at Philadelphia. We started to see men like William Carey, right, who many refer to as the father of the modern missionary movement. But this is the time we had William Carey in India, we had Hudson Taylor in China, we had Charles Spurgeon in London, we had Moody in America. 
you had this whole new wave of this gospel-centered evangelism that started to take place. You started to see gospel missionaries being sent out, and historically, it was as though suddenly the church woke up from her lethargy. And there was a real shift in understanding and a shift in thinking. And it was William Carey in particular that reset the standard and provided us with this example that one doesn't have to be skilled or gifted or special to be used in the kingdom. And I love what he wrote once. He said that to do the will of God, we only need an open Bible and an open map. And the church began to understand again that God is simply looking for men and women who are willing to go. You've probably heard this quote by William Carey. He's the one who said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God, knowing that God is the one who enables. God is the one who empowers. And notice here, as a part of this resume of the church here at Philadelphia, notice what Jesus says. It might sound a little puzzling at first. Notice that he tells them that they have a little strength. Now, that's another one of those circleable phrases if you're circling things in your Bible because I think it was and it still is the absolute key to their success and to ours as well. That word strength it's dunamis, right? It's where we get our word dynamic or dynamo or dynamite, right? Some of you got that, old enough to get that, right? <laughs> of course, it talks about like this explosive power, right? This, the strength. But he says they only had a little of it. They were just a little dynamo, right, in the eyes of the world and yet not in the eyes of God. But I think what it tells us, if we're trying to paint a picture of this church, this is probably a church that would have been pretty easy to overlook. Probably a small congregation numerically. They probably didn't have a lot of political clout comparatively. They probably didn't have all the movers and the shakers of politics or of culture who were attending it. They probably didn't have that busy, bustling, bursting bulletin, right? All that activity that we saw that the church of Sardis had. They weren't the what's happening now church. And though, though they might have been overlooked by the world, they weren't overlooked by God. And in fact, they were precisely what he looks for when he wants to do something wonderful. And I think that it's so critical that we don't allow ourselves to limit what God might want to do through any local church or through any individual believer based on size or appearance of strength or of power. Because here's a church that's relatively small, pretty powerless in the world's eyes, and yet they were an obedient church, and they were a faithful church. They were a church, we might say, after God's own heart, and God has always prized those things way above money and above numbers, above influence, above anything else. Right? Our success doesn't depend on our size. It doesn't depend on our strength because God's strength, didn't we just look at this last week as he told the Apostle Paul, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And we need to remember that concerning ourselves this morning. What is it that you sense that God is calling you to do? What is it that he's calling you to step out into or to do in obedience to him? And so often we can think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I only have a little bit of strength. And surely God is looking for someone who, you know, some big powerful person. And yet, no, he's not. Right? He's looking for you. And if you doubt that, Listen to what he wrote to the Corinthians through Paul. Right in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, 
that not many wise according to the flesh and not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Which side of the equation do you think we're on at this point? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. God isn't looking for strength in us because he has all the strength that he needs. And in fact, what God is looking for is someone who's weak enough that when God begins to pour his own strength through that person, that that person will never ever for the rest of their lives convince themselves that what was accomplished had anything to do with them. Right, and potentially rob God of the glory. So don't ever let your lack of power or your lack of stature hold you back from simply stepping out and walking through that open door when you see it. Of course, we think about David. Right Here he is, the last of the sons of Jesse, and in comes the prophet Samuel, and he says to Jesse, hey, bring me in all of your sons. And dad calls in all of the sons except he doesn't even bring David in because he was so small and so insignificant. And the father thought, what could God possibly want with him? And yet that is exactly who God chose. And God chose him to make him into the greatest king in the history of this world next to the Lord Jesus himself. God has all the power he needs. He has all the strength. He has all the wisdom. He has all of the everything that he needs. What he is looking for is weak vessels. Right? Those of us who have just a little strength that he can then pour through. And we get so paralyzed by our weakness until we understand that our weakness is the very thing that God is looking for. And when we look here at the church at Philadelphia, what we see is that God has some tremendous promises that he provides to their weakness. Promises that are great enough and are more than enough to make up for their little strength. One of those promises was back there in verse 7 in the way that Jesus introduced himself to the church. It would have been such an encouragement to this church when he said that he, he is he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Jesus had provided them, just like he's provided us, with this open door to bring the gospel message to those who so desperately need it. And what he's saying here is that nothing will stand in the way of what it is that he is trying to do. Remember in John's vision of Jesus in chapter 1, we saw that Jesus was the one who held the keys of hell and death. And the key, we said, represents authority. Right? A person who has the key to a lock has authority over that lock and therefore the door of the lock. So Jesus has the authority over our very worst enemy, which is death. And here, to this missionary church, he says he holds an additional key, this key of David. And that takes us to Isaiah 22, where he's, the key of David is spoken of. Remember, it's the Old Testament that interprets the book of Revelation for us. And just quickly, you remember, during the reign of King Hezekiah, he had this one unfaithful servant named Shebna, who abused his authority, and then he was replaced by a godly servant by the name of Eliakim, who it says was given the key of David. And to have the key of David was basically to be in the position of the treasurer, 
of whoever the current king was in the lineage of all the kings that came after David. It meant that you had power over the treasury. You could open up that door, you could close that door. All access to all the treasure happened through you. And in that time, the treasurer also had complete authority to who got in before the king and who didn't get in to come before the king. So he controlled all access to the king. And what Jesus is saying here is that what is true of Eliakim under Hezekiah in a physical realm, right, concerning a physical king of Israel, that that very same thing is true of Jesus concerning heaven. He's the one who gives us access to all the treasures of heaven. He's the one who provides us with the means to have access to the Father or not. And he is the only one who does that. So I think in this introduction, there's a reminder to them to say, look, I'm in control of the spiritual. I'm in control of all of that. And I think that that's so important, whether it's about Philadelphia, or it's about Mountain View, or it's about our own lives, or our own sort of mission field, that no one can successfully interfere with God's plans for our lives. And that is something that we can rest in. He is going to accomplish his will and his plans, and he's going to do it despite any potential opposition that might potentially come against us. Right, which brings us to this another precious promise Jesus makes to this church. Look in verse 9 as he launches into his assurance for them. He says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. You know, one way you can always tell when the Lord is at work in and through you is opposition. Right? A faithful church will always endure a great deal of opposition from the false church. And Jesus refers here to this synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not. Now, in the first century, these were those Jews who opposed the believers and their Christian testimony. We saw Jesus mentioned the same type of people in his words to the persecuted church at Smyrna. Now, he's not referring, of course, to all Jews, but to a certain type of Jew at that time who used all of their power and all of their influence to make things thoroughly miserable for the Christians in these cities during the first century. It's the very same sort of Jew that we saw in Acts following the Apostle Paul from city to city to city trying to destroy his testimony. It's the very same Jews we see in the Gospels who are constantly confronting Jesus himself during his ministry and to whom Jesus had some pretty sharp words of rebuke. Remember in John chapter 8, he says to this group of Pharisees, he said, if God were your father, you would love me. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So these are these kinds of Jews, right? Religious Jews who thought they had a relationship with God. They thought they were doing the work of God. They thought they represented God, and yet they didn't. Right? Speaking of those Jews who weren't only guilty of rejecting Jesus as their own Messiah, but now they were making every effort to keep other people from having the opportunity to accept Jesus for themselves. And you'll notice again that what Jesus says, both there and he says it here, is that behind all of that, right, the power behind all of that, all of these attempts to oppose Christians and to oppose Christianity and to stop the spread of the gospel, who's behind all of that? The devil is. Satan, with all of his power and all of his resources, is behind all persecution of all believers, even when it looks like it's coming from a righteous religious source. And so here Jesus, 
to this group of Philadelphian believers with just their little bit of strength, he says to them, hey, I've got this. You, know, you don't need to worry at all about these guys. I know they are hassling you right now, but he says, trust me, one day I'm going to humble them and I am going to make sure they understand that you were on the right side of things in terms of these questions about heaven and these questions about eternity. And there can be sometimes, even for us, when we can be in that kind of a place and the persecution or at least the opposition seems to be coming and coming and coming. And I think this is a word for us that we need to be able to just leave that fight with the Lord. Because here's what happens. If we choose to always fight against those who are persecuting us or against those who are opposing us, Jesus knows exactly what will happen, and that is that we will never go through that open door that he set before us. We'll be so distracted defending ourselves and fighting for ourselves that we'll miss the opportunity to take the gospel to the people who desperately need it. And I think that we need to be so careful and we need to be so mindful of this. And there is a balance, so please don't take this too far. Don't mishear me on this. But we are in the middle of a culture war in our country, and it is literally a war for the soul and for the direction of this country. And the stakes are unspeakably high. Of course, we're talking about temporal things, right? We're not talking about eternal things. But it's huge and it is important. And yet, we can never allow ourselves to get so bogged down by the culture war that we cease to preach the gospel or that we stop to share the gospel or that we cease to be about the gospel and to be known for the gospel but to let people know of God's love for them and of what God has done for them. Because as Christians, you know, we can roll up our sleeves and we can get into a fight with every other kid on the block and we might even win some of those fights sometime. And yet as we're fighting, how many people have slipped into a Christless eternity while we were distracted and busy over here? You think about the Apostle Paul. He was the perfect example of this. You think about the way that he was hounded every step of every missionary journey by all of these people who were doing things that were unfair and doing things that were wrong and all of that. And yet what did Paul do? He stayed on message. You could not get him off message. That message that Jesus is the promised Christ according to the scriptures and that salvation is found in him. Paul could easily have spent the last 30 years of his life fighting these people every single day and yet he didn't do that. He did do what he had to do to stay free of them and to continue to do what God was calling him to do but he stayed on message. He always stayed missions-minded. He stayed ministry-minded in his focus. And we need to watch that today. We need to keep taking the gospel out to people. Now, with that said, there are people who God has called as Christians to be actively engaged in this culture war. And I'm not saying that people aren't called to fight this battle. God calls people to stand and to fight all of these kinds of things. And yet for each of us, don't forget about all those people who are just waiting to hear that gospel and maybe waiting to hear it for the very first time. And we need to stay focused and we need to stay on message. I hesitate to say we need to stay on mission, right? We need to keep on keeping on. And in fact, if you look down, look at just the first few words in the next verse, we, what we see is that Jesus says that this church was a persevering church. He says, you have kept my command to persevere. Their lives were marked by perseverance. And that word perseverance is a wonderful Greek word, hupomone. 
And I know it sounds kind of Italian, right? Like, oh, I'll have the rigatoni with a side of hupomone, right? And yet it's Greek. And what hupomone is, is hupomone is this ability to endure when circumstances are difficult, and yet it's, it's not kind of a passive, sort of a just sitting down and, and just letting things happen to you. It's more of a triumphant facing things head on so that out of this evil, something good can come. It's a, a quality that makes progress against a trial. And there's an old saying, I think, that sums it up so well. It says that the difficulties in our lives, the obstacles we face, give God the opportunity to show his power and grace. And hupomone is what allows us to have that kind of a perspective. It's a steadfast endurance that says you just keep on going forward no matter what. And that's what characterized this little church. They didn't just quit when things got hard. No matter what, they stuck with the Lord. They kept on pressing forward. And because of this faithfulness, we see yet another one of these fantastic promises. Look at Jesus continues in verse 10. He says, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So Jesus promises to deliver these faithful believers from this coming time of judgment. Now the clear teaching of the Bible is that there will finally come a day when our gracious God will pour out his wrath in judgment on an unbelieving world. And it's what's known as the Great Tribulation period. It's that seven year period which we're going to see detailed and described for us in chapters 6 through 22 of this book. And here in this verse we have one of the strongest, strongest declarations that the church, right, the faithful and the believing church, that the church will not go through that tribulation time that we will be removed, or you may have heard the word, we'll be raptured from the earth up into heaven before that begins. And true believers today are all a part of that Philadelphia church and will not enter into that seven years of awful judgment on the earth. It's as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said that God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And note that Jesus specifically says here in verse 10, he says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. So saying that the Philadelphia church wouldn't even enter into this time of this trouble, he couldn't have been more clear. And yet there are plenty of sincere believers who hold to what's called a mid or a post tribulation position. They believe that the church won't be taken up into heaven until midway through the tribulation or even at the end of the tribulation. And yet, I would ask them to note here that Jesus says that he will keep them from, right? not to keep them through that time. If he'd meant to say that he would preserve them through the time of trouble or that they would be taken out sometime within that time of trouble, then he would have said that. And of course, we're going to see much more on this as we progress through the book. And yet, what this does is it provides such needed encouragement, certainly for the Philadelphians, but also for us, because there are those times when it seems like everything is just mounting up against us, right? And the world is just getting worse around us, and that everything is just headed in the wrong direction, and it's very ripe for judgment, and yet the promise is that one day all of that is going to change. And that before that judgment comes, Jesus promised that he's going to pull us out before that tribulation comes upon the earth. So everyone that's a member of that Philadelphia church, right, we should all be looking expectantly not for the tribulation, but for the rapture. We're not looking for the Antichrist to show up. 
We're looking for Jesus Christ to show up and to take us out of here. Now, as he finishes his words to this faithful church, here's one more quick word of admonition, but it's also a great promise. He says in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So here's an important encouragement that his return is imminent, although it may not necessarily be immediate. Remember we said that word quickly. It's the very one that he used in chapter 1, and it actually more so means suddenly. When he does return, he's going to do it suddenly. He's going to do it without any warning. And so the Lord Jesus could actually come at any moment. And understand this, that scripturally and prophetically, there is nothing else that needs to occur before the return of Jesus Christ for his church at the rapture of the church. And most students of Bible prophecy believe that it is the ne very next event on God's prophetic timetable. So the worse we th see things getting, the closer his return is. And I think that that should be such an encouragement to us as believers that we need to just persevere in our walk with him. Right? We need to remember that he is coming and we need to be prepared for that coming. Right? Don't depart from this foundation that we have as the Church of Philadelphia of walking through these open doors of evangelistic opportunity and of being reliant upon the Lord and of being faithful to Jesus and of persevering through him. We need to simply hold fast, hang on to those things. And yet Jesus says, for those who do that, for those who persevere and for those who do hold fast, he says, but wait, there's more, right? There's even more assurance for them. Look at verse 12. He says that he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So by the time we get to the final chapters of this book, they're going to detail for us the entire new Jerusalem, right? that it's going to be both the ultimate temple and it is our eternal heavenly home. And what a wonderful final verse here as the Lord directs the focus of these Philadelphians up to heaven, right, to the reality of eternity with him and of our very permanent, immovable place in the presence of God. So he's saying to these Philadelphians that they will be standing before God when everything else in the world has fallen apart, when everything else in the world lies there in a heap. You'll be a pillar, he says, which speaks of permanence. And this would have been an especially powerful picture to the Philadelphian believers because Philadelphia was a lot like California in that it was earthquake country. The Philadelphians knew what it was like to have an earthquake shake through the city and to only have the pillars of these great buildings be the only thing left standing after the quake. There was nothing in that beautiful city of Philadelphia which could really be considered stable or sure in light of these constant earthquakes. And yet Jesus is promising that this coming city, right, the new Jerusalem, heaven itself, is sure for us and it is stable, and it is safe. And then he even promises that they shall go out no more. Because what would happen when these earthquakes would hit these cities is that the people would, throughout that whole region, they would leave their homes, they would go out of the city, and they would camp in these little tents outside the city limits because they were afraid to go back in because of the aftershock. And so life for them 
was this kind of a pattern of abandoning the city, going out of this place, then coming back into the city. It was this whole sort of cycle of uncertainty, always living in fear for their safety. And yet Jesus is promising that in heaven, there will be no fear for our safety. We'll be safe, we'll be secure in that continued fellowship, that eternal intimacy that we're going to have with Jesus, right? His name will be written on us forever because we belong to him. And I love what Abraham, in the book of Hebrews, it said that he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. There is no surer foundation than heaven. And Jesus offers us that same strength that we can stay standing in him when everything around us is crumbling in ruin. And I think it's such a wonderful thing to stop and to consider that all of these promises that we possess in Christ Jesus, not only are they awesome, but they're eternal. Jesus finishes in verse 13, he says, he who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So now we see why, right? Every church wants to be the church of Philadelphia. Every believer wants to be a member of that church. And here we see such beautiful characteristics of the church, and we see the way that Jesus saw the church. We see these powerful promises that he made to that church, And then we see these marks of everyone who belongs to that church. No matter what church they happen to attend, right? whether it's Calvary Chapel of Mountain View or whether it's First Community Church of of wherever, right? These are the marks, a love for holiness, a love for truth. See there in verse 7, Jesus himself says that he is holiness and he is truth. We saw that they have a love for obedience to this truth. They don't deny Jesus. They don't deny his name. They obey that command to persevere, right? They don't quit when things get hard. They have a concern for the world, right? A great commission kind of a concern. They take advantage of those open doors that he provides to get the gospel out to the world. People in this Philadelphian church, they serve and they live in the expectation of Jesus' return and they live with that kind of an eternal focus instead of a temporal one. Yes, they have just a little strength in themselves and yet they have these great promises from God. These promises of a future crown for faithful service, this future reward, this promise of this unshakable eternal future with the Lord. Those are the marks of someone who belongs to the church of Philadelphia. And it's so wonderful to belong to that church, isn't it? Because that's the church that really blesses the heart of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the great encouragement that it brings to us, Lord, the example that it provides for us. Lord, we thank you for the church at Philadelphia. Lord, we thank you for who they were. Lord, we thank you for what it is that you did through them. Lord, we thank you most of all, Lord, that we can continue to be a part of that church. So, Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to have these same marks evident in our own lives. Lord, to help us to recognize those open doors as you set them before us, Lord. Help us to stay on message, Lord. Help us to stay sort of missionary-minded and others-focused. And Father, we just know that you can do great things through us, Lord, even with just a little bit of strength that we have. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Together.